A lot of people think what makes a person great is the big things that they do in life. Some people think that a great life is built around impressive things. Maybe it's some great deed or, man, they had extraordinary faith. Anybody get to watch Billy Graham's funeral Friday? Somebody, I know it was, air, it was streamed. I was busy. I didn't get to see that. But, you know, he died February 21st. That was my birthday. But other than it being that day, February 21st is a day that the Jewish people set aside to put a strong emphasis on reading the Word of God. And what, what great tribute it was to a man that took the gospel of the kingdom to hundreds of thousands of people. And so many times you, you, you think, what, what an extraordinary life that that man lived. And yet to hear him say it and hear his daughter and his son talk about it at the funeral during the eulogy, the greatness of their dad laid in the fact that he lived every day wanting to build a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to start a series this month as we get ready to get into to April Let's just talk about how do we make every day count. Not just count the days. How do we make every day count? Jason Crabb has got a song out. The title of it, you don't have to walk on water. But the course says this. It's the path you take. It's the steps you make that make you who you are. It's the life you live, the gifts you give, the love that's in your heart. Just try the best you can. To be a better man, you don't have to walk on water. It's how you walk on land. You see, it isn't about the great things of life. It's what can I do in the everyday things of life. How not do I make just some days important? How do I make every day important? There was a survey that was done a few years ago by BuzzFeed. And they asked people to list moments in life that was most important to them. Some of them was this. One, opening your first paycheck. Anybody remember that moment when you, now, now, now it would be probably checking your direct deposit, right? But anybody remember the first time? Another one was bearing witness to a turning point in history. July 21st, 1969. I was 14 years old. Armstrong. Walking on the moon. I remember that as a young teenager. Another turning point was driving alone for the very first time. Anybody remember that one? You was nervous? Some of you, you'd already been doing it for a while, so it doesn't want Graduating from school. How about this one? You know what was listed? Having a conversation, having an adult conversation with your parents. Some of you are still waiting for that one, I'm sure. But... Having an adult, that they listed that as one of the moments. Experiencing disappointment was a defining moment. How about falling in love? Anybody remember that? Anybody remember where you was when the first time you said those words, I love you? And, and another one was getting married. Was that a defining point for most people? Come on. Witnessing the birth. Yeah, some of you are not going to confess to nothing today. I understand. That's okay. Bearing witness to your birth of your first child. Anybody remember that one? It was part of me that says this is awesome. It's part of me that said this is horrible. This is, this is awful. You know, ladies, you do know if men gave birth to kids, every family would have one child only. I'm telling you. There would, there would only be. But you know what was listed as one of those defining moments is learning how to appreciate the moment they're in. It's learning how to live every day as if it was a big day, an important day in your life. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to come around this conversation of how do we make every day count for us. Father, this morning, I thank you again that you brought us to this point of your word. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the songs that have 
flowed out of our hearts and come from our lips. But, Father, we ask you today, open our hearts to your word. Speak to us today. Life-transforming message, Father, that would enable us to see the value of every day in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. If you got your Bibles, I want you to open up to the 90th chapter of Psalms, the 90th division. If you got your worship guide there, you're going to see some notes there. Mark Twain said this. He said, there are two most important days in our life. He said, one of them is simply the day that you were born and the day that you find out why you were born. Two most important days, the day that we come into this world, and the other one is we find out why are we here. How do we make every day count in our life? Listen, how different do you think your life would be if you got up every morning believing that every day gave you an opportunity to influence or impact somebody else for the kingdom of God. How different would your life be if you got up every day believing that it was important that you're going to live this day and you would never have another day like today? You do understand there'll never be a day like today, right? You do understand that. You understand, we'll never, now we'll have more Sundays. There'll never be a Sunday like today. There'll never be a crowd like we have here or at North Jetson or Westfield to God Pod, wherever. It will always, next Sunday, somebody will be online that wasn't. Somebody wasn't, won't be online that was. Somebody will be here that wasn't. Somebody else will be here. Listen, every day, what if we lived every day as if there'll be another day like this? What if we lived every day believing? And understanding that our days are limited and our days are numbered. This basically, when you get the Psalms, the 90th division of Psalms, the psalmist points this out. There's a lot of verses in the Bible scattered through the Scripture that simply verifies the fact that my days, your days, my time, your time is limited. It's short, and the Bible says they are numbered. So when Moses writes the Psalm, 90th Psalm, he gets down to verse 12. And he says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Now Moses lived to be 120. The Bible says he died and God buried him. Wouldn't you like for God to do your funeral? I figured up the other day, in the 45 years of ministry, I've did some 5,000 either preach the funeral or have attended over 5,000 funerals in the last 45 years. Moses died and God buried him. And he tells us in Psalms 12, I'm going to give you another version of this. He says, teach us to number our days that we may present to thee a heart of wisdom. Another translation, teach us how short our life is so that we may become wise. And then one more, teach us to realize the briefity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. When I read that psalm, I think it's kind of odd to me because here this man is, here's Moses, asking God, to make him consistently and deliberately aware of his mortality. Our mortality is something that most of us in this room don't even want to think about. But Moses said, Lord, make me aware that I'm going to die one day. He said, Lord, make me aware that the days of my life are numbered. You look down at verse 10 and he says, we may get 70 or 80 years with good health in this life. But he said, ultimately, they go too fast. So why in the world would anybody ask God and let it be a prayer to say, God, would you remind me and make me aware of the fact that one day I'm going to die? (laughs) <laughs> that seemed like a strange prayer, doesn't it? Oh, we don't know the number of the days because, listen, God's never made us privy of that information. But here's, here's what I think. I think Moses understood that just knowing and being aware that something won't last forever, it alters how you approach life. If you really understand the fact that you are going to die, it will alter how you approach your life. 
Now, now, for some of you won't get too sad too quickly through this sermon, there are verses in the Bible that tells you how you can lengthen your days. Moses, he says in verse 12 or, 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 or verse 10 of that psalm that 70, 80 years is about it. But in, in Proverbs 3, 1 and 2, he said, My son, don't forget my law. Keep my, my commandments in your heart for the length of your days and long life which shall be added to you. So if you want to have more than 70, 80 years, the Bible says if you'll keep his commandments, if you won't forget his law, he said the length of your days and long life, and he adds the word peace. Everybody say peace. He didn't say length of days and long life and misery. He said length of day, long life shall be added to you. So just doing things God's way will lengthen our days to life. And having the wisdom to understand that one day you and I were going to have to forfeit what we know is living. The Bible said this in Proverbs 3, 7, 8. He said, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. So, so just for you to understand, there, are, there is a way that we can lengthen our days. Now, how many is all for lengthening your days if you can have days of peace? I don't want to be, live longer and be miserable. Come on, somebody. Let me give you another verse. It's not in your notes, but Proverbs 10 and 27, write it down in the margin. He said, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked shall be short. And then the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 and 17, he said, Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? You do understand when we have to go to funerals of young people and somebody says, well, they overdrove, so they got hit by a drunk driver, or they did this or that. You do understand that overly wicked people and foolish people often will die before their time. Had nothing to do with God taking them. Hello? You and I have to be careful how we live in our life. Why? Because it can affect what kind of life and how long that we live. So watch this. Knowing this, let me give you some opening thoughts. Knowing this, that our time is limited, our days are numbered, it causes us to examine or even sometime alter our actual priorities. Now, use the word actual there because most of us know what our priorities should be. But listen, more and more I talk to people, I find people that have more aspiring priorities than they have acting priorities. I hear people all the time tell me, well, Pastor, I know it should be my priority. And it should be my pursuit. My family should come first. God should come first. I've got to take care of myself. I understand that. But while that may be your priority in your words, many, many times your actions don't back it up. Am I preaching? Those are the right things we know we should be doing, but often our actions don't indicate that we're really pursuing that. It's something that we say, but it doesn't often happen. But if I know that my days are numbered, and if I know that they're going to end one day, listen, it, just like Moses, it will cause me to examine what is my priorities, and listen, do I need to alter something in my life? Some of you here today, God's going to speak to you at some point in this sermon because he knows there are some things right now in your life. You want to live longer? You want your life to be filled with years, not just filled with misery? You've got to start altering some of the things that you're doing in your life today. And again, is it because God don't like you? It's because God loves you and God wants you to know what favor and blessing is to live a long life. Here's the second thing. Knowing the end of something changes how we approach the present of something. Most of you know I like to eat ice cream, right? You know that story. I like banana pudding. I like ice cream. I like to eat ice cream out of a carton, okay? And listen, can I tell you, it changes how I eat ice cream if I go to the freezer and I got a brand new carton. I open the lid. I don't get a tablespoon. I get well, I, I don't get a teaspoon. I get a tablespoon, you know, the big one. And I sit there because it's full, and I just eat away. And listen, but if I go to that freezer and I and I and I pull out my ice cream and it's half empty or two thirds gone, it alters how I approach my eating. 
I don't often get a tablespoon, Rhonda, because we have small grandkids. We got little babies. I'll get a little bitty baby spoon. Because I know it's soon going to be gone, so I'm going I'm to be careful. Are you with me? That, that, that's what the Bible is telling us. Listen, when the end of our lives come, the psalmist is talking about when we leave this earth, we, we, we know the fact that we're going to get an account one day. We're going to stand before God. It should change how we are approaching life. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews 9 and 27. Look at that verse. Is it appointed for men to die once after this comes the judgment? Do you understand that every believer and unbeliever alike is going to stand before God one day and we will give an account for our life? Now, here's what's going to happen. Every person, believer, unbeliever, is going to give an account for one thing. Here's where it's going to start. Did you receive Jesus or did you reject Jesus? It it isn't about you think he's a good teacher, he was a prophet, he was a good man. You're going to have to stand one day and give an account to the Heavenly Father. Did you accept Jesus Christ as my only begotten son who died for your sins? Did you commit your life to him? Now, if you can say yes then your judgment is done. You, there's no screen going to come up and show every bad thing. No, listen, all God's going to look at your name and say, wait a minute, his name is covered by the blood of Jesus. And you're going to walk away from that judgment seat where people's life will be given account of every opportunity that you heard the gospel preach and every time you got a chance to respond and you didn't, You'll give an account for every time you thumbed your face at God. You'll give an account for every, some of you, you, you know, if you don't know Christ and you tune preachers out and you tune your mama, your daddy out, and you just say, oh, you're just so free. Listen, there's going to come a day. If you don't correct it now, if you don't bow now, you're going to stand before God and you will hear those words. But if you're a believer, you're going to say, oh, I'm glad. But here's what's going to happen. If you're a believer... God's going to lead you to a judgment seat in which you're going to have to, I'm going to have to give an account of the stewardship. How did I spend my time, my talent, my temple, my testimony, and my treasure while I was upon the face of the earth? I'm not going to be judged for my sins, but let me tell you, I will have to give an account. Every person under the sound of my voice will give an account. How did you spend? How did you invest? What stewardship of your temple, your time, your talent, your testimony, and your treasure? And Moses understood the fact So he says in verse 12, he said, Lord, help me be aware of how few my days really are that I might present to you a life well lived. You see, the sad thing about so many people, the only time we think about eternity is at funerals. And the sad thing about when that happens, it's usually in a very uh, sentimental way or emotions are involved or you hear somebody that has total biblical ignorance. I've never seen so much biblical ignorance shows up in a funeral home. What do you mean biblical ignorance? When people start saying things like, well, God needed another little angel in heaven. No. No. Angels are not recreated human beings. Or they will say something about, oh, I know daddy got his wings now. No. It's incorrect. But listen, if the only time you think about eternity is at a funeral home, your emotions are involved, and you got, I mean, they mean well. I'm not, I'm not trying to be hard, but I'm just simply saying it's not morbid to think about death. Matter of fact, I submit to you, it's unhealthy to be in denial of something that is inevitable. Hello? Only foolish people go through life unprepared about something we know that's going to happen. And what we need to do in our culture right now, particularly in this American culture, we need to shift. We need to be thinking more about eternity, not less. 
Matter of fact, a survey was given of most Americans today. The greatest pursuit in America right now is about four things. You know what they are? Safety, security, comfort, and pleasure. People want to be safe. They want to be secure. They want to be comfortable. And oh, by the way, I want to make sure I get all of my pleasure fulfilled. Now listen, those are not bad things, but I submit to you they're not enough. Listen, when you and I are living our life in light of eternity, many activities, many goals, many many problems that we seem to be having right now, listen, they're going to seem so trivial, so petty in light of eternity. They're unworthy of all of the consumption of our time today. Yet people are saying, well, that's what I'm really concerned about. I just want to be safe. I want to be secure. I want to be comfortable. American church, we love comfort. Oh, we we are spoiled with comfort. Now, again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just simply saying life has to be more than that. Are you with me? If you and I are followers and believers of Jesus Christ and we truly understand the fact that one day we're going to give an account for him, listen, we want to be living our lives in such a way that the closer that we get to God, the smaller everything else appears to us. As your pastor, I want you to think more about eternity now, not less about eternity. The Bible's full of many metaphors. I don't have time. He talks about the Bible, our life being like a mist. It's like a fast runner. It's like a breath. It's like a wisp of smoke. Job said, for we are born, but yesterday our days on earth are as transit as a, as, as our, 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 our days on earth are as transit as a shadow. You see, I want to tell you something, okay? I read the Bible this week. I got a word for every one of us, and here's what it is. We are terminal. A hundred percent of this congregation is going to die. Now, hopefully not today. And not before I finish this message. But we're terminal. Now, that's not morbid, that's not sick, that's not depressing. It it should change what we're looking at life. Look at Ecclesiastes 8 and 8. None of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. So the question is not if we will die. The question is when we will die. The Bible says our days are numbered. And listen, God hasn't revealed the spreadsheet for me or for you. I don't know what my days are. You don't know what your days are. But here's what I know for sure. My number is less today than it was 10 years ago. I turned 63 last week. Two-thirds of my life is over. Okay, I'm a realist. Two-thirds of my life is gone. I have one-third left. Now, I'm a believer, and I think this one-third is going to be excited. But listen, reality says that my days are less today than they was even a year ago. Even I submit to you first service ago. The number of our days are less. But if we understand that, not in a morbid, sick way, fearful, worried way, but if we understand that our, our, our just as sure as we had a beginning, we're going to have an ending. If we understand our death certificate is just as certain as our birth certificate, it should ripple in our lives. It should have the ripple effect to move us towards eternity. I should be examining every day what, is, what should be my actual priority. What should I be doing with the fact? Is there changes that I need to be making in my life? So there's two truths the Bible says about this. Write this down. Number one, compared to eternity, life is extremely brief. 70, 80, 90 years old. Evangelist Billy Graham lived to be 99, almost 100 years old. But compared to eternity, it's brief. And the second truth is that earth is, our, is only our temporal resident. We won't be here long. So the Bible says don't get too attached to this earth. And here's our problem. Look at 1 Corinthians 7 and 31. Look what it says. Those 
in frequent contact with the things of this world. How many has been in frequent contact with the things of this world this week? Every one of us. When he talks about the world, not talking about bad things, ugly things, sin, he's just talking about th things. He said, make good use of them. Those in frequent contact with the things of this world become an Amish person. It doesn't say that. Now, I'm not against the Amish, okay? They, they live a great. Those who are in frequent contact with the world, get rid of your cars. It doesn't say that. Move out of your house. Doesn't say that. Make good use of them without becoming attached to them. You see what God is telling us? For this world and all in it, all it contains will pass away. Here's the message version. I loved it. He said, I, I do want to point out, friends, that time is of essence. There is no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecessary. Underline those next three words. Keep it simple. Say that with me. Keep it simple. We're at in marriage, in grief, in joy, whatever. Even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on. Listen. Because this world as we see it is here to stay. Is, this, is, that what, is it here to stay? The world is we is it here to stay? Come on. What is it? What does it die? Come on, what does it say? It's on its way out. This world as we see it, it's on its way out. Listen, that's the reason we have to train ourselves to deal, to deal spiritually as possible with the things of this world. And listen, what I've noticed in my, in my Christ walk, in my relationship with God, that, that sometimes, because God doesn't want us to get too attached to this world, in his sovereignty and his, 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 his authority and rule in my life, he allows me to go through some discontentment and dissatisfaction in this life simply because he wants me to know, Phil, this isn't it for you. This world is not your home. You're just passing through. Somebody said, I've got all of these longings I want to be fulfilled. I want to tell you, there are certain longings that you have that will never be fulfilled in this life. You'll never be completely happy here. You know why? You wasn't designed to be here forever. I see so many people who wires themselves out trying to be happy be complete. I want to be whole. You'll never do. If you look in the world, you will always come up empty. The only way to find that kind of relationship is through Jesus Christ and submitting yourself to his lordship. He will bless you. He will give you houses and land. He will. But listen, none of that stuff will ever make you happy because you know that's going to pass away one day. But everything you do for God will last forever. Well, good pre maybe North Chatson has happened to me this morning. So watch this. If I understand compared to eternity, life is brief and earth is our temporary resident. What's our biblical response? So what are we? here's four things. Write this down. Number one, life on earth is just dress rehearsal before the real production. See, we're going to spend more time eternity than we do here. Everything that's happening on this earth right now, this is the staging area. We're just in preschool, okay? That This is try out for eternity. This is to see how we can do. It's to practice before the actual game. It's to warm up lap before the race really begins. It's the preparation for eternity. And if we really grasp the truth of that, listen, we're going to begin to live differently. We're going to start making every day. I, I don't wait for birthdays and Anna. I want to celebrate every day as every day is a gift from God. And if I really understand that, it begins to color every relationship that I have, every task, every circumstance that I get involved in, every problem. Yes, it brings me heartache here. Yes, there's things that happen. But listen, everything is colored with the fact that I understand this world's not my home. Light of eternity, those activities, those goals. 
those, those, those problems, those difficulties, they're, they're, they're petty and they're unworthy of my attention because the closer that I get to God, the smaller everything else becomes. When I fly in an airplane and I, I do some and, and I get in an airplane and if I'm piloting or riding co-pilot with Alan and we take off and, and we're flying and I look at the ground, I look back and the higher we get, the smaller everything else becomes. You follow me? The higher we get. Spiritually, the more focused you become, and I'm not talking about becoming so worldly-minded or, or so heavenly-minded, you're no earthly good. I'm not talking about that. If, you, if you've been around this church, you know we're about it. But this is where this church is at. This is where some of us are at right now in our culture. We have got so wrapped up in this world. We wonder why we're full of stress. We wonder why we have the anxiety. We wonder why we go to bed worrying, we get up worrying. It's simply because we're trying to control what is uncontrollable. It has to get back to the place where we surrender everything to God. Say, God, I know this world's not my home. So here's the second thing. When we, when we live in light of eternity, we start valuing change. We put a higher premium on our relationships and our character more than we do fame and wealth and achievements. You see, some of us, what happens to you when you come to church and God puts you in the operating room and he doesn't always give you the complete anesthesia, he doesn't knock you out because everything that God wants to do in your life, you have to keep signing off on it. You have to keep acknowledging, I give you my permission. Are you with me? Some of us want God to bring us in the surgery room and knock us out and do all this miraculous transformation in us and change the way we think, change the way we behave, change all this stuff, and us just wake up and think, wow, that was nothing, man. This is good. Now, he leaves you just conscious enough to know it's happening. The knife is going through me. God's cutting out some of that stuff that is not... And I have to sign off on that because why? Listen, God, listen, God could program you to like him. He can never program you to love him. The reason Adam and Eve was put in the garden and there was two trees there, God wasn't trying to play some trick on them and say, oh, you know, you got 50% chance of getting it right here, okay. He, that's not God. He wants you to love him and follow him because you desire to do that. You sign up for this. Stuff. He could program you. Listen, we can be programmed to like people, but we cannot be programmed to love people. Oh, that's good. That's good. And some of us, because God is operating on us and moving us through the change process, we want to jump off the operating table. Oh, I didn't know he was going to do that. God said, yeah, I love you too much to, to let that stay in you. Paul said it like this in Philippians 3 and 7. He said, I once thought all these things were so very important, but now I consider them worthless. Garbage. One translation says dung because of what Christ has done. And you read Philippians chapter 3 there, and you can read all the things that he's listing, all of his, his accolades. And he said, I want to tell you guys, every bit of that stuff is garbage. How could he say that? He said, listen, it's because of the relationship I have with Jesus. Write this down. The most damaging aspect of contemporary living today is short-term thinking. God's calling us to keep a vision for eternity continually in front of us. And... Well, we have to understand that today, today, what we're living right now, it's just like the visible tip of the iceberg. Eternity is all the other stuff underneath that. You see this iceberg. You, we, we see the tip of it. We, we, we see it there. But, and, and the tip, if you were there on the water, you would look large. But listen, underneath the, uh, the, the iceberg, that's really what eternity is. Everything we see happening right now, that's just the tip. Listen, everything, all the consequences that's going on now, the deep that we're doing now, ultimately they're going to take us to our destiny in the next place. And what we have to do is stop focusing so much attention on the tip and understand everything else underneath. That's what's really important. Matthew Henry, I put this quote in, you know, said it ought to be the business every day to prepare for our final day. 
It ought to be the business of every day to prepare for, for eternity, to prepare for our final day. Nothing echoes eternity quite like a cemetery. You know, you we out at our east campus, you know, on the on the south side of a campus we got a house, we got a we got a parking lot, and you know, we had some trees and bushes. We've been taking all that out and I spend a lot of time on the on the south side of on the north side of our church. We have a cemetery. I don't like cemeteries. But this week, I, I made it a point to go by there a little bit and, and just kind of walk through the cemetery. And as I, as I walked through there, I just kind of let my imagination go. And I, I began to think about some of those cemeteries, you know, date back, the, the stones date back to the 1800s. And I got to thinking, wow, what was life like in the late 1800s or 1900s? What, what was the problems and the pain? I, I know people had issues back in that day, Right. What was the problem? What was the pain that they dealt with? Did they have the stress and did they have all the pressure that we feel today? Technology, the technology of modern conveniences today, studies show they have revolutionized the 21st century. But here's the question that everybody's asking, at what price? What price are we paying for all the conveniences? In a century following the Civil War, a handful of technology revolutionized our existence. One of them was a light bulb. You know what the light bulb did? It extended the work day. And there are some studies that say today it is a light bulb that can be traced back to what's called workaholics. Because there was a time when it got dark, you had to quit. You had a little candle that you had enough light. You could sit in a rocking chair, maybe read a book, maybe read. You had a, a usually a, a violin or fiddle or guitar. You might gather. You might have a conversation. But when the light bulb was invented, they said men started working longer days. Here's another one. The electric appliances that came on the scene, making tasks easy. Easing up the drudgery. You know what? You know what the, the side effect that was? We started losing physical strength in our culture. Because you no longer had to pack the water from the well inside. Come on. That took muscle. You didn't have to go get the wood to light the old wood show to get your meal. Oh, good preaching. Jet engines collapsed the distance as did radio and television from one destination to the other. But what did it do? It began to raise expectations and increase anxiety. <laughs> we, can, we can go places now in a matter of hours, and it used to take weeks to go. Yet you, there's not any more stressful place than go to an airport where you get on a plane and within two hours you can be from Chicago to Nashville, Tennessee and in a matter of two hours you can be getting off and yet you go there and everybody's stressed. Everybody's saying, why, can't, why is it taking so long? Hurry up. Get me all that. Come on, am I preaching? Air conditioner pushed us indoors on hot days. Two effects that happen. We... we Reduced our vitamin D intake. Some, some, some studies are saying that's where we're having some of our health issue. We don't have the vitamin D intake. But, but also, it, it moved us away from being cordial neighbors. You know, used to sit on the porch in the afternoon. And everybody go by and you'd wait, hey, Joe, hey, Sally. 30 years ago, your closest neighbor was 25 miles down the road, but you knew their name, you knew their kids. Today, most people don't know who lives across the street. I'm guilty. I drive in my driveway, I got one of those little buttons on my mirror, and I push on it, my garage door goes up, and I get in there, and before I get out of the car, I push that little button, it goes down. I tell myself I'm like Batman sometimes, you know, going into the cave. <laughs> you know how we try to spiritualize stuff all the time. Oh, you need to, you've been around people all day. You got to go in your bed. <laughs> Computers increased obesity levels, and it also created an industry that we now call fitness centers. <laughs> fitness centers come out of the revolution of the computers. 
Now listen, all I'm simply saying is I walk through that cemetery and I look at those tombstones, I can't help but recognize that everybody's life comes down between the day they were born, the day they were dead. Some people have dashes, some people don't. But everything comes down is what do we, I listen, what, what, I, I looked at one cemetery and I thought and I, and I looked and I, I wanted to get a picture of it and I didn't get it in time. But I thought, I wonder, I wonder what he lived for. What did he, who did this guy love? What was his dreams? What was his passion? What was his biggest mistakes? What was his greatest successes? Here's the one I always like to ask. What's your greatest regret? It's the biggest thing in your life. See, the most damaging aspect to contemporary living right now is that short-term thinking. We didn't get to decide where we was born. We didn't get to decide who our parents would be. We didn't get to decide what period of time and culture we're going to face. We don't get to decide our death date. The only thing we have control over is our dash. The only time we have control over is today. We get to decide how we're going to live that. And I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and I see so many people living their dash, hurriedly spending precious time chasing things that don't really matter. And I thought about what Paul writes here in Romans 13. He says this. He said, this is all more the urgent. Everybody say urgent. For you know how late it is. Time is running out. Now, again, this is not morbid. This is, don't, please don't be fearful. It's not about fear. It's not, I, I, I'm just trying to get you to think more about eternity, not less. Time is running out. Wake up. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. So two more points. Number one, we have to live with a sense of urgency. That's what Paul is talking about. He's saying time is running out. You hear that urgency in those words? You have a limited amount of time, and yet people live as if they're going to live forever. There was a survey done among college students. They asked this question, if you could know the exact date of your death, would you want to know it? 87% said no, don't tell me. And now that 87%, they acknowledge that they wanted to live in a sense of denial. They did not want to face their mortality. Listen, most of us get lulled in this deceit that we're going to live forever. And I wonder how many times that people get to the end of their life and they look back over and they say, what happened? I'm 63. It doesn't seem like I should be 63. It seems like I should be younger. Yet after cutting trees and drilling holes through tuba fours and tuba tens that I didn't mean to do, but it worked. My, my arm is so sore today, I can't even hardly get it above, you know, anything. But what happened? I hear people say, man, I have so many lost opportunities, so many, so many things. And, and here, here's the most dangerous word, in, I think, in the, in, the, in the American language right now, the most dangerous word. It's not Republican, okay, or Trump. Here's what it is. It's someday. You hear people say it all the time. People have someday syndrome. Oh, you know what? I tell you what, someday I'm going to make things right with my parents. Well, you know, you know, someday I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have more time for my kids. Someday, I'm gonna talk to this friend about Jesus. I know he needs Jesus, and I'm just waiting for that, that right moment. Someday I'm gonna do that. I put that word in your notes. I left a blank there. Don't let the Holy Spirit bring something. Take that. Think about it this afternoon. Listen. Someday I'll. The, the problem with Sunday is it robs us of this day. I was looking, I, I found the word, you know, everybody procrastinates. We keep putting, all, I, I looked up on the web and tried to find a procrastination website, and all, all it came up was something flashing that said, soon to come. Duh. What did you expect from a procrastination? <laughs> soon arrive. And listen, what, what we have to understand today that 
that, that tomorrow is the unknown. There's no guarantee. Listen, God's grace is what covers our past. It's his care is what's covering our future. But if I understand that his grace has covered my past, his care is always wrapped up in my future, then I have to learn how to live today. Today is the only day I have. I have to make every day count. This is the day that the Lord hath made is what the psalmist said. I have to embrace it. This is the day that I don't know about tomorrow, but I can live for today. I don't want to take my life for granted. I live with a sense of urgency. I value change. And here's the last thing. I'll close with this. I live with a sense of priority. If you're really going to make every day count, our priorities have to change. Any, anybody here wear, wear bifocals? Anybody here wear, not trifocals? Now we've got trifocals. I mean, they, they're messing everybody. Trifocals. You, got bifocals. you know what bifocals are designed for? Bifocals are designed to let you see one thing here and one thing there, right? You, you, you know, some of you need bifocals just to read, but your eyes are good for long distance, so you have bifocals. And I thought about that this week, and I'm thinking how that you and I as believers should live and wear bifocals. We should have one eye on eternity and one eye here upon the earth. And begin to prioritize our life and our actions and, and living in such a way that, that we are looking forward, but we're here. We're in the moment. Paul said it like this in Romans 13. He said, so don't live in darkness. Get rid of your evil deeds. Shed them like dirty clothes. Clothe yourself with the armor of right living as those who live in the light. Again, this is about light. This is about shedding light. We are living in the light today. You can't walk out of this building and simply say, oh, well, I, I didn't know that I'm going to have to stand before God. You do know you will stand before God one day. You can't walk out of here saying, well, I didn't know I was going to die. Yes, you listen, we are terminal. But in light of that, okay, in light of that, listen, we, he, he ta- has this image of putting off, taking off and putting on clothes. So what do we take off? What do we take off? Listen, he talks about the, taking off the frantic pace of life. Why is that important? Because watch it, listen, hurry is the enemy of abundant life. For many of us in this room and some of you watching online, listen, the enemy knows he cannot get you to do something bad. You've got bad covered. You don't want to do bad. You, you, you want to do right. You want to live right. He don't want you. And listen, he tries to come to you to, 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 to tempt you to go steal or lie or kill or commit adultery. He doesn't win. So listen, so instead of trying to get you to be bad, he's okay with just keeping you busy busy. The badge of busyness is worn today in our culture with honor. Oh, I'm so busy. The badge of busyness should not ever be worn with honor. The badge of busyness is a curse to your health and to every relationship you have in your life. Because every one of us in this room, we understand that speed, now listen, speed is always the enemy of intimacy. Intimacy with God, intimacy with other people. When you are so caught up in just do it, getting through the moment, getting through the time. That's the reason why God, you do know God's got a top ten list, right? You do know in God's top ten list, he's got a day called the Sabbath, which was built in there to help us have the rhythm of life. Work sick days, take a Sabbath. Sabbath wasn't just something for the Old Testament followers. We desperately need it in our culture today to help us with the frantic, frizzled life that we are living. And if I'm going to make every day count, I have to make sure that I'm eliminating this, this ruthless enemy of hurry. I fight it every day in my life. I submit to you. I struggle with this one. Because I'm always, I, I'm, my, my thoughts are always ahead of me that I miss the moment sometimes. I miss the, I miss the opportunity. I'm saying, God, help me. I don't want to spend my life, the rest of my life, the one-third I have left, I don't want to spend my life always in a hurry. So he said, put off this frantic pace of life. Here's the second thing. We have to put on more time for relationships. 
It's the flip side of taking something off. It's slowing down, allowing time, paying attention to the relationship. It frees us up. It frees us up with God. It frees us up with people. Why is that important? Relationships with people are so, so important. Relationship with God is so important. You understand that Jesus was a great example. Uh, he, he, he was able to block out tremendous time to nurture his relationship. Listen, would you like to have had Jesus' schedule? He prepared for ministry for 30 years. He only had three and a half years. And somebody asked him, well, what's your mission on this earth? Well, I come to die for the world. I'm busy. None of your business could ever compare to the Son of God. But you know what he did? He always took out time to nurture the relationship that he had with his Heavenly Father. He understood giving God the first hour of every day. Oftentimes in the Scriptures you read, he got up early in the morning, went off by himself to pray. What was he doing? Building that relationship. He nurtured that relationship with his disciples. His disciples ticked him off sometimes. They did. You know what? He always nurtured that relationship. Many people, I think, today around us, and some of us you have family members right now, they're longing for our attention. And I always hear people say, well, if I knew I was going to die today, here's the news flash. You might. Well, if I knew I was going to die soon, here's a news flash. You might. What would you do if you knew? Moses said, Lord, remind me. My days are numbered. Sad thing about some marriages today, you reduce your communication to just managing schedules, and you wonder why your marriage is in trouble. Who's picking up the dry clean? What time's dinner going to be tonight? Who's going to pick up the kids for the soccer, the grandkids? Some of us have got to slow down long enough to be willing to have that conversation. I told Rhonda this week, I, I, I am so honored to have my son want to work with me. I'm so honored to do that. But in having him work with me, there are times... Our conversations are just about church and ministry and people and projects. And we lose that father-son time. We don't have those conversations. I've got to work harder at that. Because I love this church and I'm putting everything I have in this church. But if I, do, if I lose my family, if I lose the relationship, none of this stuff is worth it. And some of you have got people in your life, they're crying out for just your time to value that. Yeah, they, they may do stuff to tick you off. They may have a value system that's not even close to being your value system. But they need you to make them a priority in their life. How do I make every day count? How do I make every day more about today than, than tomorrow? How do I make every day more about the people in my life than possessions? How do I make every day about God's priority in my life instead of my own plans? How do I make every day more about the eternal than I do the temporal? Clock is ticking. I, I said, well, come on, stand with me. i got to quit. I, I know my time is running out. And, Again, I love two services. I love the opportunity we give for people to come. But it does put me in that time crunch often. There are Christians from a certain tribe in Africa who when someone dies in the Lord, they never, they never say they departed. In, instead, they, they speak from the vantage point that they tr triumphantly and joyously, joyfully, everybody goes by the, the area, the viewing area, and they say these three words, they have arrived. Not that they parted, not that we lost them, they have arrived. When Winston Churchill had planned his own funeral, he planned it to have it St. Paul's Cathedral. And he had a lot of hymns that were sung, but one of the things he had planned that very few people knew about, that he posted a bugler in St. Paul's dome. 
And after the benediction was given, that bugler was commanded to play taps, which taps is a universal sign for the day is over. It's past. It's done with. But Churchill, surprisingly, to everybody almost there, had also arranged for as soon as taps had finished, another bugler would take off with reveille, the wake-up call. And taps was played and reveille. And he wanted people to understand the fact the worst thing that happened in life is not the last thing that happens in life for believers. And death has to be the worst thing for us. Because we, we still don't can't grab our hand and our emotions around the fact that somebody we love that's there in that carcass, that temple, that body that we have so embraced, praised for how many years? But for believers, the worst thing in life is never the last thing in life. You have to hold on to that. And I think God is challenging some of us. And I want, I want to challenge you as your pastor. I want you not in a morbid, fearful, worried way. I don't want you to go home and try to look up your horoscope. I don't want you. It's just going to bring hard. Don't go to, don't go to the web. Find the death clock. Put your birth date in there. Don't, don't do none of that stuff. All that's going to do, all, all I'm simply do is brought you to the Word of God to let you know. As Moses said, Lord, teach me to number my days. I want to live a life of wisdom. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about some things we can pray every day through this whole process that the Bible gives us about this. This morning, I want us to close with this time. And here's what I want to ask you. Ever head up, ever eye open, because here's the most important thing. I said it earlier in my message. There's going to come a day, every person in this room, at North Judson, Westfield, God Pod, soon to be our East Campus, every person in this room, you're going to walk before the judgment throne of God. When you breathe your last breath here, you're going to be uttered into his presence, and you're going to have to give an account. Did you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? The greatest thing that can happen in your life is to know that he is your Savior. Not that he's a good man, he was a prophet. No, he's my Savior. And if you've never done that, or maybe maybe you've done it as a child and you've drifted away and, and you're, you've wandered off the path and you say, Pastor, I want to I wanna be sure. I'm tired of going to these funerals. I'm tired of hearing things about people that die, and I wonder what's going to happen. If that's you this morning, I want you to raise your hand right where you're at and say, Pastor, I want you, I want you to pray with me today. I want Jesus to end my life. I want him to be the Lord. I want him to be the leader. For anybody in this house, down in North Judson, Pastor James is there, Westfield Campus, people are there. They're going to see your hands. Anybody, anybody on the Internet, raise your hand. Make, make, make a move on the Internet. Somebody be there because we want to pray for you this morning. God, I want to be sure. Here's the other question I want to ask you as we get ready to pray together. Just simply the fact of understanding that the Bible says that we we have to make sure that we understand that this life is not all there is. is. Is there things in my life that I need to put off? Is there things in my life that I've set as a priority that, that I'm not... I'm not living it as if it is a priority. Give God the first hour of every day, the first day of every week, the first consideration in every decision, the first part of all of your time, talent, temple, testimony, and If you do those four things, I want to tell you, your life will radically change. 